Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm Sarah Montross, Interim Artistic Director and Senior Curator here at De Cordova Sculpture Park and Museum. I am delighted to welcome you to our virtual event this evening with curator Robert Bob Cozzolino, who will speak on his upcoming exhibition, Supernatural America, the Paranormal in American Art. Supernatural America promises to be a groundbreaking exhibition that explores the numerous ways that artists in the United States have made sense of their own experiences of the paranormal and the supernatural. Um, the show opens this spring in June at the Toledo Museum of Art, travels to the Speed Art Museum, and then returns to Minneapolis, the Minneapolis Institute of Art, Robert's home institution. So advanced congratulations, Bob, on this incredible, incredible project. Um, Thank you. Many years in the making, and I'm so excited to hear about it. Um, Bob Codolino, born on Halloween, um, has been the Patrick and Amy Butler Curator of Painting at the Minneapolis Institute of Art since 2016. He started his job there on a leap day. Bob has been called the, quote, curator of the dispossessed for championing underrepresented artists and uncommon perspectives on well-known figures. His curatorial approach integrates community and collaboration, and he is devoted to making space for emerging curators. Born, raised, and educated in the Midwest, he is also an improvising musician. His publications include essays for monographs on Gertrude Abercrombie, Peter Bloom, Sylvia Fine, David Lynch, Peter Saul, Henry Asawa Tanner, and many others. Um, prior to 2004, to, from 2004 to 2016, he was a curator at the Pennsylvania Academy um, for the Fine Arts in Philadelphia, where he curated over 30 exhibitions and added more than 2,000 objects to PAFA's collection, including the Linda Lee Alter Collection of Art by Women and major gifts of work by Sue Ko, Ellen Lanyon, and Miriam Shapiro. Um, so I had invited Bob to speak tonight, given the connections between his upcoming show and our current exhibition, Visionary New England, which is on view here at De Cordova through March 14th. For those um, who aren't familiar with this show, Visionary New England explores the rich history and legacy of utopian spiritualist and animist practices in the Northeast since the 19th century. And a few years ago, um, as I was in the early stages of exhibition planning and starting my own research into the paranormal or spiritualist activities of, of New England, um, several colleagues told me that, oh, you have to speak with Bo Bob Cozzolino. He's working on a similar strange eccentric project. Um, and so at the time we did have a phone call, we did connect and we shared support um, around our mutual interests. But we actually haven't followed up since that time. And so fast forward a few years now amid the pandemic and upheavals of the past year, these projects are, have come to life or are about to. So I'm just so excited to be knowing that on parallel paths, we've been working on these projects and just to hear how yours um, has developed so expansively. So i um, really pleased you could join us. Um, if people in the audience have questions, I know that you will, because we've seen now a preview of this PowerPoint, um, please include them into the Q&A function, although the chat function is also a place to put comments or questions as, you're ta as we're hearing Bob talk. And um, we will have a hard stop at 7.30, if not before. So um, we'll try to get to questions um, as much as we can. So with that, I'll turn off my screen and welcome Bob. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And Welcome everyone and thanks for inviting me to speak. Um, I want to take a moment before I start to acknowledge that many of us in attendance occupy native land. I am speaking to you from what we now call Minneapolis, which is Dakota land. Uh, and this is the ancestral home of the Dakota, Ojibwe, and Ho-Chunk people who were forcibly exiled from their land because of aggressive, persistent settler colonialism. I make this acknowledgement to honor the Dakota people, ancestors and descendants, and the land itself. I encourage attendees to take a moment to honor the histories and of peoples of your region um, and to uh, educate yourselves about the land that you're on if you don't know yet. There are a lot of resources out there. So as Sarah mentioned, I have been working for many years on an exhibition called Supernatural America, the Paranormal in American Art, which uh, was going to debut in Minneapolis this week. 
um, or a couple weeks ago, but because of the pandemic, we leapfrogged over our, uh, our venues and are going to be in the finale spot, hopefully in a time when we can actually gather together with community. Um, it'll open at the Toledo Museum in June, then travels to the Speed Museum of Art in October. They get it during Halloween, I'm a little jealous. Um, and then it'll be here um, uh, in time to coincide actually with the birth of spiritualism's anniversary. So maybe it's you know also fortuitous in that. It's accompanied by a catalog published by the Minneapolis Institute and the University of Chicago Press. And I was the general editor and contributed to it, but um, I was very fortunate to be able to wrangle uh, and coerce a number of people working adjacent to this subject, but also some artists like Renee Stout, Tony Osler, and John Hota Leanios to write pieces for the book. So I'm very excited about that and I feel honored to be with them in it. The exhibition uh, has as its premise that America is haunted and that haunting is personal, national, psychological, and social. And it looks at the different ways that our artists have tackled that idea that um, there is such a thing as haunting and there's visitations from otherworldly beings and there's supernatural unexplainable aspects of the world that we can feel, uh, we might channel, we experience and we might not have uh, a western science uh, based uh, rationale for them but we know they're real uh, because phenomenologically in our bodies uh, we are sensing these things and they're true to our experience. And so it's looking at artists who felt that um, and made art to try to visualize the intangible. And that ranges from images in photographs like the spirit photograph done in Boston uh, to works by Dorothea Tanning uh, and Alison Saar. And the scope of the project goes from this object from the 1780s, a tiny uh, memorial um, pendant uh, that's only about one and a half inches tall, uh, high um, that shows the graveside uh, connection between a dead daughter uh, who's breaking out of this obelisk to make contact with uh, the mourning uh, mother to a whole room that was made by the artist Whitfield Lavelle as part of a larger project uh, called the Richmond Project. This is a parlor room that um, honors the, the spirits uh, of people who had lived in the Jackson Ward um, uh, community in Richmond, Virginia, and the names of people who lived in that community are read um, uh, by an actor uh, as you walk in, and the entire place is charged with the feeling that there is a visitation there and you're with the spirits. So it's divided into four sections. Uh, America as a Haunted Place, which looks at um, why spirits inhabit the United States. And I'll get into a little bit of this later, but um, this includes works like Emanuel Leutz's 1864, image of an angel hovering above the Civil War battlefield where the dead souls uh, are sort of swirling around that angel uh, depicted as these featureless bodies that are now going to be incorporated into uh, the otherworldly. Or a piece by Howard Dina Pendel called Autobiography Ancestors Middle Passage. And that is a piece that is about the traumatic effect uh, uh, on the living that results in haunting. And we can talk about that in a literal sense, but we can also talk about that in how America is a place that has to reckon with its violent past, whether it's the genocide of Native Americans or it's slavery or it's other kinds of violence that have happened to people uh, across what we now call the United States. Um, in Howard Dina's uh, very intimate self-portrait uh, that deals with this kind of history, it deals with the idea of the Middle Passage, of the legacy of slavery, and then um, honors spirits that are floating in this watery, um, uh, kind of mirror uh, around her as she dives in. And so it's looking at all these different kinds of points of view from a historical way, from a personal way, and sometimes uh, those two uh, integrated. America's a Haunted Place also deals with the idea of how artists dealt with mourning culture, 
whether it's in a piece like Midnight Vigil by Charles Alston from 1936, where we see a deathbed scene and it's not really clear whether everybody in that room is actually a flesh and blood um, living member of that person's family. It's clear that some of them are, but I think there's also a, a suggestion that ancestor spirits are in that room simultaneously, perhaps to take the soul to a safe passage to the uh, other side. And then this piece by Fernando Oriano, which is from 2012, um, which is uh, part of a whole series of ghost machines that Fernando made that were um, taking objects that he had found at uh, yard sales or estate sales that had belonged to now deceased people and felt that they had some kind of energy in them or were really important to that person and put them in these machines that he designed to be operated by ghosts uh, and triggered by ghosts. In this particular one there on the right, it's called, um, it is called His Minerals. It's a collection of minerals that a man had owned um, and also a little bundle of incense. And when he is in the area, when the ghost comes, it will trigger this lever that's on the left uh, that holds a match, which strikes and then lights the incense. Um, and then you can smell the residual effects of that throughout a gallery. There's a section devoted to apparitions and the broad range of ways that artists have depicted apparitions, whether we're talking about Marvin Cohn or Morris Cantor's haunted house images. Um, Messina Barton, a Chicago-based artist who did a whole group of aura portraits in the early 1930s. Or Bill Viola, whose piece Three Women, of which this is a still, it's in our collection, is part of a whole series of, of pieces that explore the passage from one side to another, from one state to another, uh, the idea of transfiguration and um, looking at the body as something that can be fluid and goes from um, one state to another and was inspired by um, a poem by an African um, poet, uh, which has as the line, uh, some of the lines, the dead are never gone, they're in the breast of a woman, they're in the crying of a child, in the flaming torch. The dead are not in the earth. They're in the dying fire, the weeping grasses, whimpering rocks. They're in the forest. They're in the house. The dead are not dead. And that has been a premise of a lot of the work that is in this show cross-culturally and also across generations, that the dead are not dead. We can access the realm that they're in. They communicate with us. They're here as guardians, they're as guides, they're giving us information, or they're taking over our bodies and actually having us make art, another thing I'll talk about later. Uh, there's a whole section devoted to channeling spirits and ritual that includes works like Barbara Bullock's guardian figure on the left, Renee Stout's installation that seems to be uh, made for uh, someone who is able to make spells um, uh, and potions and things like that. Um, and also images of mediums, uh, like this one of Marjorie Crandon, um, on loan from Tony Osler. And then also a piece by um, Carolee Schneemann, who uh, had the, the inspiration for um, her piece, Interior Scroll, come to her in a dream. And she, wrote, she drew this picture um, right after waking, um, after having that transmission. Rachel Middleman, an art historian who teaches um, in, in California, wrote an essay in the catalog that's all about the goddess movement in feminism in the 1970s and sort of repositions those artists as part of a thread that goes back to mediumship and the power of women in mediumship. And then finally, there's a section devoted to plural universes. And this is where we get into blurring the lines between visitors that are coming from the spirit world and also then spirits uh, or um, entities that are coming from other worlds, whether they're extraterrestrials uh, or something else. And it looks at the way that artists have come up with ways of envisioning that. In some cases, these artists claim that they saw these things, um, in most cases actually in this section, uh, but some are exploring the idea of the relationship between invaders um, and colonialism as in Chris Papan's piece on the right, um, or, you know, Prophet Royal Robertson, uh, who's represented by a number of pieces, uh, uh, actually, you know, 
heard in transmissions um, and voices through um, radios and other kinds of things and saw lots of um, visitations around his home and depicted them. Um, it also is a place where artists like John McCracken <laughs> Uh, and Howard Dina Pendel are actually recontextualized based on my conversations with Howard Dina, but also um, the kinds of things that John McCracken consistently grounded his work in and told re re um, interviewers about. You know, we can think of Black Plank here uh, as the quintessential minimalist modernist sculpture, but <clears throat> uh, glossed in those histories is that McCracken consistently said he was making the kind of thing he thought um, uh, extraterrestrial intelligence could place on the earth and thought of himself as channeling these uh, this information from otherworldly beings. He very much felt that aliens were among us and they had come and uh, we just needed to be able to be on a different vibration in order to actually sense them. And so it recontextualizes that directly into that that place. Howard Dina Pendel's piece M64, which is based on an uh, image of a galaxy, was actually included in a 1982 Queens Museum exhibition on UFO imagery that Bud Hopkins, a friend of hers and the sort of father of UFO abduction narrative um, and therapy, um, asked her to be in. And so this piece was the piece that was in that. And Hardina had many anecdotes about visiting Bud Hopkins and seeing like pellets and jars that had been removed from an abductee's neck um, and uh, also had her own experiences of the paranormal that still um, terrified her that she had witnessed in her own home. Um, and also this, this exhibition includes a lot of material culture from the history of spiritualism um, and, and other adjacent kinds of philosophies and religions. So Brandon Hodge um, is a collector in Austin, Texas, who generously lent a lot of this material, and Tony Osler, the artist, who's represented in the exhibition by this piece on the left, uh, the upper left, but also uh, has been a, a collector of the archives and ephemera of occult practitioners, spiritualists, um, and um, UFO imagery like um, the Georgia Damsky photograph on the, on the bottom left. So the, the premise of the show is also that we're taking these artists seriously. We're taking them at their word. We're not discounting the things that they say they experienced. And we're thinking about what are the ramifications for the broader culture if what they say is true. So that would be true of Ionel Talpazan, this man who was an immigrant to the United States who had an early formative experience with a UFO and in New York, in the 1980s and 90s um, made hundreds of sketches and drawings and paintings and a big sculpture of the UFOs um, that he had witnessed or knew about um, or was getting information about somehow telepathically. Um, and they read as specs, um, and sometimes um, very specific kinds of engineering specs. Um, and as much as possible, I talked to living artists about this to make sure that the context for their work was respected and taken seriously, but also that I wasn't misreading what their work was about. So visiting people like Betty Saar or um, locally um, in, in Minnesota, the, the Cree artist um, Choling Taha, who uh, has had many experiences with spirits and has painted them uh, based on visions that she's received, fully formed in her head, uh, and then transcribed after witnessing them. And where I couldn't talk to the living artists, um, you might think I went to a medium to channel them. Don't think I didn't try, but um, I went to the archive, which is the next best thing for art historians, um, and uh, looked at diaries and correspondence and interviews to make sure that the artists that are being included in this exhibition had the experiences themselves. They experienced poltergeists or ghosts or felt that they had clairvoyant abilities, um, experienced telepathy, all sorts of kinds of things that have to do with the paranormal. Gertrude Abercrombie, an artist based in Chicago, is one of those artists. And people that you might not expect, whether it's James McNeil Whistler or William Sidney Mount, who went to seances and who had many paranormal experiences and actually witnessed um, spirit art being made at seances. 
uh, had communications from Rembrandt, uh, who claimed that Mount was the best artist in the United States uh, at the time, or the one that he liked the best. Um, so, uh, and also we know that he went to see mediums on the speaking circuit, like the trance medium uh, shown here, Miss Emma J, uh, who's very well documented as a trance medium who went around the United States giving lectures publicly. Um, so, you know, obviously part of the appeal to this is that people love a thrill and it's exciting to, um, to consume supernatural tales, whether it's the Washington, also, the Washington Irving story about Ichabod Crane being chased by the headless horseman, or, you know, having gone to experience the phantasmagoria um, in places like Philadelphia and New York um, in the early part of the um, 19th century. And of course, the legacy of, in entertainment today persists in, uh, you know, films like Poltergeist or TV series like <clears throat> Stranger Things or podcasts like Welcome to Night Vale. It's everywhere. And I'm sure everyone on this um, who's watching now can come up with, in just the last two weeks, many instances in popular culture or media that have had to do with the paranormal in one way or another. It's omnipresent. But what's the deeper meaning here and, and, and why the United States? Um, when I gave very early in the process of this, a, a talk at the Archives of American Art, when we can all still be together in the same room without masks. Um, after that talk, uh, my colleague Eleanor Harvey asked me, so why the United States? You know, why is this, why is this, why do you want to focus on haunting in the United States and what's specific to that? My answer was that I kept having this image of John Gast's 1872 painting, um, Progress, uh, which is a manifest destiny painting. It's what you see here. And that <clears throat> I kept having this image of that idea, uh, which of course is a settler of colonialist myth um, of this angel, uh, this allegorical figure moving and sort of pushing out Native Americans and also wildlife and bringing with her the telegraph and progress. Um, in modernity. And I'm going to switch for a moment just to show you something um, here that I kept having this image in my head of that figure turning into an angel of death, that she had a doppelganger that was sinister, that was really actually reaping souls. And those souls are unsettled and they populate the United States. We have to confront them and make sense of them and live with them and make amends to them. And somebody pointed out much later, a colleague at Mia, um, in our education department that an artist had actually made a video about this. And so that artist, John Jose Leanos, is included in the exhibition and, and has written a piece for the catalog. And I just wanted to give you a sense of what that is like um, right here. So that's John's piece, uh, or part of it. It's a seven minute video. Um, but <clears throat> that is pretty much what I kept thinking about, that that was one of the rationales here. And, and then there's a lot of artists that have dealt with that in different ways that are included in the exhibition, um, not just contemporary artists. But I also wanted to sort of contend and educate myself about the history of the religion of spiritualism, which has as its foremost tenant that um, there is no death and that we can access the spirit world. And this world here is permeable and spirits can come and go and they can contact us and deliver information to us, help us or not. Um, and that we really need to respect these spirits. And <clears throat> so um, spiritualism began in 1848, although lots of ideas similar to it were around before then when uh, the Fox sisters in Hydesville, New York, heard rapping and were able to intelligently communicate with the spirit. Um, and spiritualism has had many sensational um, moments, but it's a serious religion that's still practiced, and um, it had its peak in the United States in the late 19th century. 
and there's a rich visual culture of spiritualism that still uh, has not really been adequately dealt with. Spiritualism has had a resurgence in the humanities. There's lots of new books that have come out on spiritualism, thinking about it in, from lots of different angles. But uh, in spiritualism's, at least in the 19th century's wake, there's thousands and thousands of pages of books, of automatic writing, there's archives that are still untapped, and there's a lot of spirit art, um, some of which is contextualized in this exhibition. Um, and from really the very early history of it, from the 1850s, um, there are books being produced that blur the lines between uh, the idea of spirits coming from um, a land where the soul has gone uh, to otherworldly places, celestial spheres. And so I think that's the connection to the section with plural universes where people are talking about um, the idea of interplanetary and interdimensional beings. That's already in the history of spiritualism from the very beginning. But taking spiritualism seriously as a reform movement, uh, as a social movement that um, really was a place that privileged women and was not hierarchical in terms of its religion in the way that some other Western religions are, um, is also really important and really set the tone for how I looked at mediums who are artists, um, who are spirit artists, who are channeling um, the spirits who are making art. Um, the early suffragettes were embraced by the spiritualist and spoke at spiritualist camps. Um, another thing about spiritualism that a lot of scholars have been looking at, although um, certainly there are um, places in spiritualism that are far from anti-racist, there are certainly places in spiritualism where um, uh, diversity was welcome and Blacks in America actually had a place that was of power and of an important role. So when you look at things like their conventions, um, this is a 1922 convention that the spiritualists had in Chicago. Um, all throughout this book, there are advertisements for African-American spiritualists with their addresses and what they do, um, what their specific talents are interspersed throughout this book. So that is a, an area that really needs a lot more attention, a lot more research. Um, in the humanities, it's getting attention. Um, and uh, it's, it's a fascinating aspect of this that I, I think could be brought out more. I went to the spiritualist camps of Camp Chesterfield and Lilydale and met mediums and talked to them um, and got a better sense of what practitioners are actually doing now and went to have a reading with a fifth generation medium named Gretchen Clark. Um, and a lot of uh, ancestors to spirits came through for me um, that actually related some information that only my family would have ever known. Um, throughout my life, I've had different kinds of experiences with the paranormal uh, firsthand um, with friends, um, watching people uh, uh, that I was experiencing paranormal activity with um, see these things in real time. Uh, for a while in Chicago, I lived with roommates, uh, one of whom's mother was a Santeria priestess um, who came over and did cleansings after certain kinds of spirit entities were found or um, reported in our apartment. So this has been something that I've been interested in and um, immersed in for a long time personally. Um, and it really was turning to the archive and thinking about the way artists are depicting things and why they're depicting things in American art that led me to really um, develop this show in the way that it's been developed. So there's a lot of artists who you may know and artists that you will definitely not ever have heard of together side by side in here. For me, I did my dissertation on Ivan Albright and the um, uh, kind of repeated idea that Albright's work is all about decay and the macabre and death never sit, sat right with me from the beginning um, in a painting like this called a Vermonter which I know is reproduced in Sarah's book um, that he did when he was in Vermont um, later in his life after living most of his life in Chicago. A painting like this uses a realist technique to actually show extra realist information, uh, the intangible, the soul coming out of the body in these little halo discs that are coming out. And um, there's something about the way that Albright depicted materiality in a way that felt like it was crawling and growing and full of life, um, not just sitting there static, that suggested that he must be interested in these other kinds of philosophies. And lo and behold, in his notebooks, 
he was a searcher, constantly looking at the idea of a spirit world, the intangible soul that's inside of us that we can't see, but we feel and has power and energy. And he tried to reconcile materiality and that soul constantly in his realism. Now, <clears throat> to end this, I, I wanna just introduce you to several of the artists that are new to art history, American art history, um, uh, who are integrated into this exhibition. Um, and they're really, they're spirit artists. They're artists who, uh, weren't just um, having sightings of ghosts, but were mediums, were practitioners, they were spiritualists, and they claimed and asserted over and over again that they weren't responsible for making their work. Spirits entered their body and controlled their hand, and that is who was making their art. And in several instances, they knew who the spirit was and they identified them. Now, there's been a lot of attention to some of some European spirit artists over the last several years, Helma of Klimt, um, Georgiana Houghton, and Emma Kuntz. And so it, it made me wonder, is there an equivalent kind of American tradition of this? And of course there is. Um, it looks different in some cases, but it's pretty varied. Early on in the 1860s and 70s, um, there's Wella and Pet Anderson who were a married couple who were both mediums and were able to channel spirits and um, make portrait drawings of folks who were dead um, for clients who are coming to get images of um, their loved ones in spirit, but also were channeling um, spirits identified as the ancient people or the ancient band. Um, and these were spirits that had lived hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago in some cases, who were coming through and giving teachings that another medium was actually copying down while the Andersons were making these very detailed pencil drawings of the spirits coming through, like this one. There are artists like um, Elizabeth Connor, who was active only at Camp Chesterfield as a spirit artist and medium who during seances would um, make depictions of certain spirits who the people at the seance wanted to contact. In this case, the daughter who died very young um, of one of the founders of Camp Chesterfield. Um, and so this is a person who's not trained at all, um, who started drawing uh, automatically uh, according to accounts when her hand started to uncontrollably start moving around during a seance. And the interpretation that everybody had at that was that the spirit wanted to use her as an instrument and was trying to indicate that she should put something in her hand and start making the drawing. And as a result, Elizabeth Connor made several of these kinds of drawings. Other um, practitioners of spirit art uh, are the Bang sisters, um, Lizzie and May Bangs, who were active at the end of the 19th century into the early 20th century at Lilydale and Camp Chesterfield, although they were based in Chicago. Um, but they went to these spiritualist camps. And they were um, one of two couples who were practitioners of precipitated spirit painting. And that's what this is. And what precipitated spirit painting is, is uh, a painting of an image that is done without the intervention of a human hand at all. There's tons of accounts in old newspapers um, and archives of the Bang sisters and then their sort of rivals, the Campbell brothers, who were a, um, a same-sex couple. Uh, they were um, practitioners of this at seances where they would have a blank piece of paper or a canvas, and that's what happened in the case of this particular work. And during a ritual, um, they would cover it up and they would not be anywhere near it. And gradually, the pigment would precipitate almost like kind of atmospheric sort of weather conditions, um, like a bloom on the, the image or on the canvas and gradually the image would start to develop. Um, and so in this case, what happened is this gentleman here, Dr. Doherty, he was actually alive. He came to get a posthumous portrait of his wife and the um, Bang sisters were able to have a spirit produce that and when she appeared on this canvas, he asked, uh, why can't our daughters come too? Because apparently they were also in spirit. And so then they appeared too. And often what happens in these accounts of Bang Sisters work is that 
the eyes open at the last minute <laughs> um, as though that's kind of the signal that it's complete. And there are many accounts of people trying to trip up the Bang sisters, um, thinking that maybe they're frauds, but nobody was able to quite understand how they did it. And the Bang sisters and spiritualists um, firmly believe that it is precipitated by spirit, the energy of a spirit impressing itself on the canvas. Other spirit artists that are included in the show are Helen Butler Wells, uh, an incredibly important medium and teacher who had a seance circle called the Jansen Group, uh, active in New York. And she made hundreds of drawings and also channeled teachings from people ranging from um, Pythagoras <laughs> uh, to all people from Atlantis and also from Saturn and Venus, um, which she actually drew portraits of them, um, spirit guides from the past and from the from um, otherworldly dimensions, and then made hundreds of these drawings that are uh, automatic drawings she did during seances with the circle, where words uh, and images are deeply embedded and intertwined in these um, uh, incredibly organic drawings, like this one or this one. Um, and there's messages embedded in them, and often uh, her spirit, spirit artist who was guiding her hand was a spirit claimed his name was Eswald, who um, had been in the service of a Spanish king uh, many centuries earlier. And in 1922, the Anderson Galleries in New York actually had a big exhibition of spirit art featuring five artists. And um, when that happened, Eswald actually um, issued uh, from the spirit world a press release. So um, Helen Butler Wells' spirit was also very savvy in terms of trying to get people to go to the exhibition. Other people in that group were Emily Talmadge, there on the left, and then Norma Oliver, who um, uh, also practiced with Wells. And one of the things that's actually interesting about these spirit artists is that some of them don't start making spirit art and channeling spirits until after they experienced something of a deep loss. And Wells' is, um, uh, experience. She had lost her son and her husband. Um, and uh, here, Emily Talmadge had been taking care of this young girl, it was kind of a nanny, and she died. And she didn't start making drawings until um, the mother was trying to make contact through a medium with this, um, this daughter. And she wanted to give messages through Emily Talmadge. And then she eventually met Ellen, Helen Butler Wells and was making these mandala drawings. Um, with the spirit. Uh, Norma Oliver, uh, we know less about. She seems to have been an adopted daughter of Wells later in life, and then eventually was the steward of her legacy and, and put her papers in, a, um, in an archive that you can access, um, but, and became like the kind of the spokesperson for the Jansen Group's teaching afterwards. She became the second instrument after Wells died to um, uh, Eswald, uh, although in this image, which is a kind of spirit portrait of Helen Butler Wells, I kind of think that Helen Butler Wells actually took her hand. One of the most fascinating artists is um, in this exhibition who is a spirit artist is Marion um, Spore Bush, who uh, was actually one of the first women who um, graduated from a dentistry program in the University of Michigan and then had her own practice. Uh, at the very early part of the 20th century. And then um, after her mother died in 1919, she traveled around and then eventually wound up in Greenwich Village. This is a, a Peter Julie um, photograph of her from the 1930s in her studio. She did relief work on the Bowery during the depression um, and then married a very wealthy man and became the kind of talk of the town in New York because she was so colorful, but she also was a spirit artist. And she never identified um, a particular spirit as her spirit who was controlling her hand, but she wrote an autobiography, uh, an autobiography called They, um, that is what it's called. And she always referred to the spirits as they with a capital T and said that it was a chorus of spirits that were controlling her and speaking telepathically to her and directing her hand. In 1922, it was published in a number of newspapers that she had um, 
premonitions and messages from the spirit world about a vast catastrophic war worse than the last war, meaning worse than World War II, one. Um, and the spirits were very detailed that it was a Pacific based war and that part of it was that indigenous people on Pacific islands were angry about colonialism. So a very fascinating kind of set of premonitions that she got and she wrote about. Um, and then when she started having the spirits control her hand, um, almost all of the work is apocalyptic or it's about a coming war. It's really fascinating. Um, she exhibited a lot in New York in the 1930s and 40s and um, she's ripe actually for a whole solo exhibition somewhere. Um, these are examples of her work. This is the piece that is in the show. It's called Wherefore War and it was done around 1933 and shows masses of armies and piles of golden skulls in the foreground. Um, uh, on the way to war and right afterwards. Another artist um, based in, in Lilydale is Clara Barnett, Clara Barnett, who uh, received messages from a dead physician um, named Robert Jan Jansen, or Jensen, who was basically interested in helping her demystify what happened during medi mediumship. She wrote a series of articles about this and then uh, apparently made collages based on what he revealed and then had an illustrator make these watercolors. We don't know who the illustrator was um, and we don't know where the original collages were. In fact, it's not really clear whether Barnett didn't actually do these. There's a lot that still has to be sorted out, but these exist and they're extraordinary and they show what they purport to show what happens during mediumship. So this is automatic writing. This is transfiguration. And the spirit enters a medium and you can see them superimposed on that body at that moment, um, clairvoyance, um, and then uh, there's many, many, many more of these. Uh, another artist uh, who is a spirit artist who is active at Camp Chesterfield and was likely formally trained at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago was Francis Haynes McVeigh there from 1950 in a self-portrait on the left and then a portrait of her done by a photographer. She did automatic drawings and, and automatic paintings and she did hundreds of them and they're all at Camp Chesterfield. Um, these invariably have messages about the passage of the soul, the safe passage of the soul and what the soul's predicament is like in the afterworld. Uh, so these are all done automatically. Um, this is a painting called Microcosm. Um, that she, she tried to get exhibited at the Art Institute's Chicago and Vicinity Exhibition in 1960. Um, there's a sticker on the back of this, but it wasn't in the catalog, so it may have gotten rejected, but it's an extraordinary automatic painting. It has myriad details in it. But another series that she did um, with the spirit of William Blake, um, that was her main spirit that she, she did work with, um, are these soul travel drawings, which have these continuous lines and then underneath it, underneath it automatic writing um, that explains what has happened here. And it seems that each one of these um, is, uh, what happens is the spirit of William Blake took control of her hand when a soul left the body and William Blake tried to show her the path that a soul took between when it left the body and then got to its destination. <laughs> and every one of the bits of writing underneath explain that and sometimes show the character of the soul and also talk back to her as though telepathically Francis Haynes McVeigh is asking questions of William Blake. Finally, uh, Agatha Wachachowski, who's probably the best known of these artists, um, she was shown at Cordier uh, Gallery and then its Werner Gallery in the 1950, in 1960s. Um, the artist Richard Linder um, introduced her to a dealer, but she was a spiritualist um, healer and, um, uh, and uh, practitioner who went around to churches and preached and also um, very late in life had spirits control her hand. She produced hundreds of pages of automatic writing. Um, and when she did do drawings, finally, um, spirits took her hand and for every case, um, what she said is that um, 
she had no set information about how it was going to go, um, that they always began in the left, bottom left corner and proceeded in bands up the, the surface of a piece of paper. Um, she used a spirit trumpet, which the spirits whispered into um, and gave her directions. Um, but she also heard them telepathically, um, so sort of clairaudiently speaking to her and directing her. Um, and the range of work that Agatha Wachachowski has produced is extraordinary. It's small, um, tiny sort of drawings of heads to fields of multicolored bodies and landscapes that seem like they're the afterlife to these I, my, some of my favorites are these ones on the left, where it's these bands of soaked in color, and then um, these faces that are emerging. Sometimes the faces are emerging and they seem to have actually come out of the paper. Um, there's a lot of scraping around them. So um, she other, also did things like um, these kind of ancestral readings of people's bodies. So she would have a student, um, in this case, the man there, uh, who was learning mediumship from her, uh, put down his hand, she would trace the hand, and then spirits would help her fill in the faces of people that represented the past lives of that person, but also their ancestors in spirit. She did this with feet, and she also did these um, with hands numerous times. So these are some of the spirit artists that are introduced in this exhibition. Um, and uh, it, that's that's what I have for you. Um, so that's an introduction to this show and its scope, and I'm happy to try to answer questions if anybody has them now. Robert, thank you. That was so absorbing um, just to see all this incredibly diverse type of art making or mark making, however, all the different types of making you're describing. Um, the way in which this show is sort of also dismantling conventional hierarchies in the art world, which, you know, merging together trained, untrained, um, unnamed artists, material culture, fine art, so many things about this show actually do, do much more than just describe what you do, do much more actually, I think in terms of revising the canon of art in our history in the modern, in the modern sense. Um, I wonder just to kick off one question and then I welcome others from many people. Um, just this question of, of art history or modern art history, the 20, our history of the 20th century, let's say, let's start there. And it's, and it's comfortable, how uncomfortable or, or comfortable it has been with the supernatural. Um, like in time, you know, it sort of gets written out of modern textbooks. So I was wondering if you could talk about your relationship to these subjects as a corrective in a way, or, um, in thinking about the, what was the impulse of coming across a pro creating a project like this um, and developing it. Sure. <clears throat> so there's a lot to say about that, but I think in a nutshell, um, you know, this American art history, so historians of American art relate to really take on any kind of religion, <laughs> you know, looking at religion and people's work. Um, that seems to be changing. And it's been led by, you know, a whole range of people, Samantha Baskin, um, dealing with Jewish artists um, and really going to detail about the nuances between different kinds of artists and their relationship to that, um, but also Christianity. And that's, that's fine. Um, but there's so much more to talk about. And I think still um, the idea that somebody may have uh, seen a ghost um, or feels like they're clairvoyant or feels like they were visited by aliens or abducted by aliens is still in society kind of looked at as a completely marginal and, um, you know, it's testing people's sanity, whether that's real or not. But, you know, I have found by talking to people and looking at the way that artists talked about this stuff in the past, that there's this other kind of reality and there's other kinds of um, wisdom and experience that people have gotten from being in the world that they want to incorporate into making objects and things or making things to be containers for spirits. And this is whether people find it um, abhorrent or frightening or not or absurd or don't believe it, 
it is a constant thread in American visual culture from the 1890s to, or from the 1780s to the present. I mean, it is everywhere. And so we have to, as art historians, admit that it's there um, and maybe take ourselves out if we're skeptical of the, uh, the question and say, these artists are serious. So what are they saying? What do they have to tell us? Um, and I think this, this kind of constant sort of traditional Western notion of grounding things in a supposed, you know, binary or reality that um, doesn't hold any water for me and never really has, I've always been skeptical about. Um, I was raised as a Catholic and, you know, my experience is that Catholics are talking to the dead all the time <laughs> um, and appealing to them. Um, you know, I don't practice anymore, but I think that maybe already kind of uh, opened me up to the idea that ancestors are around us and that there are at things that we can't explain and that, um, that we can access certain parts of reality that maybe other people have discredited. So I think that when we're looking for subjects and we're thinking about the meaning of the way things look, you have to take what artists say seriously and you have to then contend with what have they put out in the world and what are they saying about the state of humanity through making these images. So I think, you know, I've always been somebody who has been skeptical about any kind of idea that history is this modernist progression in art history. I've railed against that my entire career and looked at artists that have been overlooked. So I think I'm already somebody who was sort of primed for that. But I think art history is still very, very worried and, and maybe conservative. Um, you know, there are some artists' descendants who wouldn't allow some of their artwork to be shown in this exhibition or gatekeepers who wouldn't allow that, even though the archival record showed that the artists themselves were completely motivated and interested in this subject matter. So it seems to scare people. Right, I think it, I, that, that answers a lot of what I was sort of thinking about as you were talking. Some good questions have come in. I'll try to um, proceed with them. So one is, um, can you just say more about what, how you were thinking through the themes of the exhibition now in the wake of COVID? So has this pandemic and the social upheavals, uh, violence and so forth around um, racial injustice, um, have those affected now you're thinking of this show and its topic, have they amplified it? Um, can you talk about that? So, you know, most of the show came together before, um, before COVID hit and um, yet, you know, during, between March and now, um, we've had a chance to sort of tweak in the editing of the catalog to acknowledge that, um, you know, there's been immense loss and we're, and COVID has changed grieving. You know, people can't grieve in the same way that they were able to traditionally. And it's forever changed the way we think about our relationship to one another. And then at the same time, of course, here in Minneapolis, there's a murder of George Floyd and, <clears throat> um, which followed many other police killings in this city um, and in St. Paul. And it's a community that um, is really committed to holding, um, you know, folks responsible, but also really holding one another and being empathetic and really trying to change. And so when that happened and it resounded around the United States, I think a lot of folks here um, really wanted to understand what a show like this might mean. Um, and for me, I just kept going back to the contemporary artists who are in this exhibition who are dealing with the idea of a national haunting and the political and, and sort of, you know, colonial ways that um, violence was sort of, you know, brought on and then how America is constantly dealing with, because it won't deal with, um, the things that brought it into being. And those ghosts are constantly confronting us because I think as a society, we still kind of won't admit what's happened in the history of this country. And over the summer, it just felt like um, a lot of people were saying, we can't, we can't, um, we have to confront this and we have to admit it's real. And we have to do something about it. And so I think part of that is going to change the context of how this 
show maybe is experienced, but it was always kind of on the minds of the contemporary artists who are in this because haunting is a really important metaphor for how we deal with history and how we either um, make peace with it or we don't. It's never, these ghosts won't go away if we don't make peace with them. Um, but it also has real life implications for how we treat people and how we think about what kind of a culture we want going forward. So I think hopefully we can have people come to the museum in person the way we, we used to have people come to the museum because I think it's a, it's a project that is going to be a natural way of bringing different kinds of community groups together to think about how we, we memorialize the dead, how we remember the dead, how we think about um, you know, a sort of broader idea of the spirits and ancestors and who we want to be going forward for a generation that we will be the spirits too. So there's a lot there. Um, you know, I don't think any of us have really fully sort of thought through what that's going to be like, but something struck me in the last week when I was um, doing the final review of the catalog. I was looking at Rachel Middleman's essay and at the very end, she sort of pauses and says that when she's writing, um, the nation is dealing with the pandemic and she's thinking about mourning and loss and that. And at the time that she wrote that essay, 100,000 people had died in the United States. And as an editor, general editor of the book, I had to write a note that <clears throat> acknowledged that five times that many since Rachel wrote that essay have died. And that's not very much time. So I don't know what the implications for loss and memory are going to be when the show is on view. Um, but I feel like there's a real societal need to sort of deal with this. Yeah, that's very powerful, well said. Um, just one more question as we come to the end of the time we have. Um, there's some really interesting ones. I'm sorry, I can't respond to, we can't respond to all of them. So one person was interested in um, you're talking, and I think you have framed this well, but I would be interested to hear more about how you how you chose to focus on America um, versus other other communities, other places that are um, dramatically spiritual. Um, and so that framing of, uh, and I think through your description of the founding of America in this way, and its um, yeah. exploitation is is one way to describe it. But wondered too if you could also talk about any transnational. Um, conversations that emerge as you're talking about these? Yeah, I think the simple answer to that is practical. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is a huge topic. Um, yeah. You know, there could be a whole separate show just on UFO imagery internationally. There's a whole Mexican retablo um, uh, ex voto tradition that includes ghosts and, and UFOs. Um, you know, just, just to make it not sprawling and, um, you know, all over the place, focusing just on what had been produced in the United States was important. But also, I think for my field, it was important to say, um, hey, some of the artists that you kind of think of as um, the staples of American art history, like James McNeil Whistler or Andrew Wyeth or Grant Wood, um, they were actually really engaged in this stuff too. Um, and that there are different artists who um, maybe we've kind of nor we sort of, they're just, I think they're thought of in a certain way. They had much broader interests and beliefs. And so reintegrating them in this kind of context shows, um, you know, I think mostly just how prevalent the idea of the, the practice of spiritualism was and the different adjacent ideas. Um, so, but the main thing is that, you know, the other way to focus this was really including artists who had firsthand experiences of the supernatural and the paranormal, that they said that. Um, and, uh, you know, a handful of the people who are in this show, they're making images that are about the idea of, of the paranormal, the supernatural, like John Kedor's Ichabod Crane painting. But the majority of the artists in here I included because I knew they themselves had these experiences and or they said their work was specifically about that. So, you know, part of it's practical. I'm sure that there can be, I think that the other aim that I always have when I do a project is that, you know, this is not even remotely the final word. There's so much more to do. Um, but nobody had really looked at it quite like this. There's been exhibitions that are just about, um, you know, Afro um, sort of, 
Afro, the, the spirituality in the um, sort of the African diaspora in the Americas or something about, um, you know, Mexican culture in, in LA in particular and the relationships to the dead. But nobody had sort of looked more sort of broadly at artists that you wouldn't necessarily think of um, in terms of their practices of thinking about spirits in the spirit world. And they really needed to be integrated into this. And um, so anyway, so that's, that's part of it. Thank you. It's a, I can only imagine how much you've carried in your brain with the research of this project and the number of types of people you've been talking to and researching that it must be, a, it will be a relief, I'm sure, to also relieve, relieve, open this show and, and see it on, on the other side as it becomes public. So um, thank you so, so much again, Bob, for this talk and um, for everyone who's joined us and um, for the questions that we received. So we'll sign off now and thank you everyone. Hope you have a great night and um, keep your eyes out for Bob's show and catalog, um, which will be coming out soon. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.